Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word. Chapter 11, the great book of Revelation. We're going to pick it up with verse 1. Fantastic, the 10th chapter following the 9th, which identifies the false Christ. How long he will be here on earth in power. Time shortened to a five-month reign. And then in that 10th chapter, where Christ would say, I beheld Satan as lightning fall to the earth, then you heard about the seven thunders. That's what lightning causes. That means after the repercussions that come, the moment the Antichrist's feet set up on earth for that five-month reign. You want to be ready, especially now that we learn, just as we close the 10th um, chapter, the voice of the seventh angel began to sound. That's the very events that precede the coming of the true Christ. So with that having been said, you actually have a chapter here that is inserted that lets a believer know exactly three and a half days after the fact. Now remember what I said about after the fact, meaning after the two witnesses die in the streets, Christ will be exactly three and a half days. Naturally, you do not know until that event transpires. But after that, three and a half days, the seventh trump's going to sound. Christ is going to return. So it is good that our Father, as, um, as we learn from Amos chapter 3, verse 7, Christ through the Father has already said, or the Father through the Son, I will never do anything that I haven't foretold my prophets. I mean, it's all right here if you'll just read it, if you read it with understanding. Having said that, uh, let's pick it up, if we may, chapter 11, verse 1. Let's get the chronological order of events uh, as they transpire. Verse 1, and there was given me a reed like unto a rod. Now, usually a measuring reed is not a rod. This is kind of a rod for correction. This is talking about the second advent. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. In other words, it's measuring people. Who makes it? Who doesn't? Who is utilized? Who God's elect are and who are not? <clears throat> it is a rod for correction and even uh, destruction, if you would have it so. You see, the wrath of God is about to be poured out. Verse 2, but the court, which is without the temple, leave out, or you cast it out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city sh shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now, naturally, forty-two months is basically three and a half years as far as months go. And and uh, let's look at a current event. One of the signifiers or things you should notice, how long does the temple area stay under Gentile control? It is to this day. The Dome of the Rock is very much secured, um, and not by a Christian religion, certainly. And uh, so it will be until that time. But 42 months, moons are always of the night. Months are a prophecy that pertain to that that is evil, which is to say Satan. Days, the sun, is always prophecies concerning God's children, God's elect. So we see here why there is need for that rod of correction is the very temple itself at God's command. Why? Because we're going to convert many people, Gentiles and otherwise. Verse 3, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand 
200 and three score days. That's solar, okay? Clothed in sackcloth. In other words, um, it'll be a time of correcting. Now, there's a beautiful bit of knowledge um, hidden within there. Uh, if you know, as God always uses moons, how long is a month? Well, a month is only 29 point something days. A month of solar on the solar calendar is 30 days. So when you add 42 times that, the two witnesses arrive here quite a few days before that end comes, before the evilness transpires. Those witnesses that will be um, allowing the Holy Spirit to feed through that menorah, which is to say to the 7,000, that's to say to God's elect. Many of you wonder, what will I do and how will I be informed? You're going to be told right here. That's why God never leaves those that he um, covers. And this is why he would say in chapter 9, verse 4, you cannot bother those that have the seal of God in their forehead. You can't even kill the others. You can sting them, you can deceive them, but you cannot kill them. So, but God's elect, he says, don't you even touch them. And we see here why. Because he sends the two witnesses, and certainly they have power, considerable power, and we have the two witnesses, uh, say, 10 days before the false one appears. That's time to get things organized. That's time to know which way the wind's blowing and um, how to arrange a campaign. Verse 4 to continue. These are these, the two witnesses. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now, it, there is a clue given there that you must understand. Well, well, who are the two witnesses? Well, there are two people that are standing before God. God of the heavens, the earth, the sea, everywhere. Well, where are they standing? Well, they're with him. Well, how could they possibly be with him? Well, he didn't die. Well, how many people have been on earth and gone to heaven without dying? Well, uh, Enoch we know. He was so good that and taught against the intermixing of the fallen angels and the daughters of Adam that God just simply, he was a preacher and he preached about that and God simply took him. He was good enough that he didn't want him tangled up in it. But then, what you have to jar awake to is God never would let anyone bury Moses when supposedly he died. And God himself took him. Even in the book of Jude, devil, the devil argues and hunts for the bones of Moses. Well, why can't he find them? They don't exist. Because in... Matthew 11, who is it that showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Christ? Elijah and Moses. And Moses had many wonderful things that transpired when, they, when he freed, the, with God's help, the children of Israel from Egypt. I mean, uh, fire down from heaven. Seas turning to blood, many, many things. The death angel passing over all that have not the mark. The, the dominion of Almighty God is able. I mean, no problem at all. So you want to be real careful when you start, especially if you get some coop that comes along and says, I, I'm one of the two witnesses. Oh, you're standing before God in heaven? and you're going to appear 1,260 days before Christ returns? Well, that's good news. Only, I don't think you can get anyone to believe that. I think God chose the two witnesses a long time ago, and they are worthy, and so it is. What, what, what is olive? It's the oil of our people. It's the oil of the lamp. Even the ten virgins, when some of them five were out of oil, it's olive oil, Eliyah in the Hebrew time. 
to all of our people. You've got to have it. It's truth. It's knowledge. And it is wisdom. So um, let God's word lead you into an understanding of what's going down here. Verse 5, And if any man will hurt them, that's to say these two, and through the branches of the menorah who they're connected with, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies, and if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So there is a tremendous amount of power with these two witnesses. Why? Because God is with them and with all that they serve. You know, I, I want to, uh, this is not a new thing. It's written of in the Old Testament in uh, Zechariah, the great book of Zechariah, in chapter 3, we see this stone with seven pairs of eyes being God's elect. And then in chapter 4, we see Zerubbabel, that one that was born in Babel, confusion, but came out. Well, what brought him out of confusion? Truth, God's word. <clears throat> then he was asked, what, what? There was a plumb bob set there, God's elect are on the end of that that uh, string that God's own natural law of gravity keeps everything straight and narrow. I mean, up and down, right on course. And uh, we have a lot of help because these two witnesses uh, feed w this uh, lamp without, it flows without the help of man or gravity. It's naturally, it's with God. Verse 11 of the fourth chapter of Zechariah, and it reads, then answered I, and I said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? You want to know? Well, listen to it. It was told of long ago. And I answered again, and I said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? They feed God's elect. It's the Holy Spirit. That's what causes the oil to flow. And um, verse 13, he answered me and he said, Knowest thou not what these be? Question. And I said, No, my Lord. He's going to tell you. Verse 14, then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. They stand right before him and by him. God uses them. Then you wonder why Moses and Elijah showed up at the Mount of Transfiguration. The Hebrew is very specific in this. He says they are the two sons of fresh oil, that that feeds and that that does not leave us wanting. And there you have those two. And, and a little thing you might overlook in the prophecies and the fact that, again, um, where we learn that God will do nothing that he doesn't foretell his prophets. Let's take that Elijah, one of the ones who, who was a prophet of prophets. And Jezebel, wants his, he, she wants him real bad, wants to do away with him. She sends an army after him. And of course, God always takes care of his own. Open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 1. Let's look at Elijah a little bit and what happened even in the flesh concerning him with um, verse 10. Verse 10 of chapter 1, 2 Kings reads, And Elijah answered and said to, of the, to the captain of 50, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Whoosh! You see, God has power for those witnesses anytime he so chooses. And you would fear something? If you don't have anything to fear but fear itself and what you wouldn't know about God's word and how he protects his own. Verse 11, also, and again also, he sent unto him another captain of 50 with his fifty. And he answered and he said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. 
And Elijah answered and said unto them, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. And so it was. Well, soon the next old boy finally wakes up and says, I, I know you're a man of God. And I, I want to plead with you that uh, we don't want to be burned up. We, we want you to have mercy on us. And God spoke to Elijah and told him, you, you go ahead and go down. I've, I've got your back. That's my words, but that's exactly what it's meant. And, and you know, in 1 Kings chapter 18, God has a sense of humor. I, I just love it. Elijah was the only prophet left, basically, and there were 400 better Baal prophets there. And they challenged Elijah big time. And so Elijah built and had, had him build an altar and, um, and uh, had him to sl slaughter uh, an animal for sacrifice to their God and told him that you all call fire down and have God, your God, consume the sacrifice. Well, they started early in the morning, and they went all day, 450 of them, praying and dancing, wanting fire to come down from God. And Elijah got off on the side, and he kind of chided them. If you think God doesn't have a sense of humor, in the Hebrew, in one place, kind of even says, maybe your God is off to lunch, or maybe he took a potty break, you know. And, and naturally, this did not help the situation. Finally... Elijah dug a trench then and had water poured in the trench and on everything where seemingly you couldn't light a fire. And then God brought fire down from heaven and whoosh, the altar was cleansed. So God has a sense of humor and God takes care of his own. Why I wanted to cover Moses and Elijah the miracles that God did in the presence of Moses, freeing all of Israel, the nation, was only a type of freeing them from Babel, Babel and again, in these end times. So what has been shall be again. If you understand the beginning, you'll most likely understand the end. So here we have these two that come, and they are they have this oil of our people that flows without the aid of man, but by the presence of the Holy Spirit as he siphons and feeds the light in those 7,000 when they witness and how precious it is. This time is upon us. And the beauty is that God would send them a few days before the Antichrist even appears for comfort, for advice, for knowledge, and uh, leadership. Verse 6, back again in uh, Revelation chapter 11. Let's go with it. These have power to, sh to the two witnesses. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. That's the sign of Elijah. And have power over waters to turn them to blood. This happened with Moses' time and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. The power like Moses used in Egypt, okay? Verse 7, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. Now here's where Satan really messes up. God gave him orders back in chapter 9, verse 4. Can you remember what it was? Touch not those that have the seal of God in their forehead. And here he takes the two witnesses and has them killed, breaking God's command, which means big trouble for him. Verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street. This word is pata in the Greek. It means in an arena. They're going to party. Of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Why? Because of the degradation there, where also our Lord was crucified. Talking about Jerusalem. 
when the Antichrist stands where he ought not, the abomination, the abominable one. Now, um, the, the point is, why, why wouldn't they bury them? Because they still, in certain quarters, if Satan's little children say that Christ did not rise from the dead. And they're going to lay these two out publicly and openly in an arena so that three days they're going to still be there. They're not raising three and a half days, they're going to lay there. And we're going to witness it that they're dead in a hammer. Okay. That's what the wicked one is saying. Verse 9. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half. Now this is why you know when Christ returns after this fact, not until, but after this fact, you have a time limit. Three and a half days, Christ returns. And shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. They, they want people to watch them. Verse 10, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them. This kind of gives you a clue of how many will be deceived by the false Christ. And make merry, oh, they're celebrating, and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. By the powers they could perform, they, they raised old Billy Ned, so to speak, with the whole bunch of them. And they were glad to be rid of them. Verse 11, listen carefully. And after three days and a half, exactly, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Man, they were dead three and a half days, and they're, they're walking. They're standing up. This is where the sad awakening when people realize they've been had big time. Because the word fear here in the Greek is epipito. It is a paralyzing fear comes over them. A lot of them have been in church all their life and maybe read this somewhere. Well, it seems like I've heard that before. You should have studied it. You should have absorbed it. You should have eaten the little book. You should have known better. Verse 12. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. They saw them go. What have we done now? And here the two witnesses are removed. Three and a half days, seventh trump's going to sound. Thirteen, and the same hour was there a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell. It's a shaken. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand. That's God's fallen angels that return to this earth again. They're going to die right there. Fini, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Why? Because God destroys the wicked ones that are cast out with Satan, which we'll find in the next chapter, chapter 12. And for every negative, there is a positive. There are 7,000 of God's elect, and there are 7,000 of the very, very worst that are Satan's army. And they're going to die instantly when that happens. Why? God's through with them doesn't need them any longer to correct children. Got their number all right, and boy, are they set. Uh, so, but the remnant, that's to say God's elect, will give glory to God, for it's going to happen exactly as it's written. Have you read it? Have you read it believing it? You can read it knowing it. That's the way it's going down. You should not be surprised when you see it come to pass, for it shall in and to this generation of the fig tree. Verse 14, the second woe is past, 
and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. That's the second of the three. Fifteen, and the seventh trump sounded. Here it is. And there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. I mean, there's not going to be any break. He reigns through the millennium period and into, on into the eternity. There is no break for Christ. 16, and the four and twenty elders which sat before God on the, their seats fell down, fell upon their faces and worshiped God. Why wouldn't they? when you see the wonderment and the blessings and the glory of the presence of the living God as he protects his children. Nothing to fear but fear itself when you have the knowledge of God in your forehead. 17, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned, and he will reign, will reign forever and ever, eternal life to those that deserve it. Yes, those two that stand before God are going to come to earth a few days before the false Christ comes to prepare God's answer to that malicious um, group of lies that will come down upon our people and they will have power that stings and no one can bother them until God allows them to be um, placed in that prat or that arena in Jerusalem and even that is for a purpose a purpose to show that our father is in charge in control and things always happen as they're written Verse 18, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto the servants, thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, that's the set aside ones, God's elect and them that fear thy name, that revere him, that love him, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Natural, those that corrupt the earth are simply going to be gone. That, that day of reckoning is coming. The important thing, you know, most Christians like to put themselves on guilt trips and they only have one meaning to the word judgment. They can only see because they 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 uh, they um, get themselves on guilt trips so easy. You never want to you never want to forget what Christ said. When you repent, forget it. I don't want to hear about it again. But little old Christians say, "I may be a bad person. I've been bad all my life." Oh, you are a bad one, all right. But once you repent, it's gone, and God doesn't want to be bothered with it. And you just aggravate him when you keep bringing it up again, when he's already forgiven it, washed it away. It's like calling Christ a liar. And, and so what this day is for is your reward for those that deserve it. It's, as you've often heard me say, this is the day that everybody gets everything that's coming to them all at once. To some, it's going to be bitter. That's true enough. And to some, it will be great rewards. And, and here, of course, it pretty well identifies. The word saint throws some people. You think, well, it's got to be something. No, it just means in the Greek, set aside ones. And God set aside the elect. Why? Because they did not fall in the first earth age. They earned the right to be called God's elect. One more verse to complete the chapter. And the temple of God was opened in, in heaven. Mark it. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. Naturally, we know what this brings to pass, but 
the ark of his testament. So many people write stories and spend lifetimes looking for the ark of the covenant, the ark of the testament. And it shows they've never read God's word because one of the two witnesses took it with him. It's not on earth any longer. And, and it's understandable. Why would God leave it on earth with the mess that man has made here? So naturally, you want to see the door of heaven open? You can see it sitting right there. It's not even a, a, um, a second hand one made in the likeness of the real thing. It's the real thing. It's there, mercy seat and all, right there in heaven. And our Father looks forward to those and that time of correction. You know, we have uh, one day with the Lord from this point to the eternal temple when that great white throne judgment will take place. A great deal of time went by to that judgment, a thousand years in our time, whereby we, the set-aside ones, and God's prophets would have an opportunity to convince as many as they could the real truth and to pull away from the false one. But is it not ironic that even as you read this chapter, just when the two witnesses are in Jerusalem, how many party there? Most of the world. Most of the world deceived. That's why it's so important that the truth be taught in the actual chronological order of events to save as many people as possible from that embarrassment, from that shame of being deceived by none other than Satan himself, which anyone is raised to dislike him, but yet at the same time not taught to recognize him when they see him. And you have so much false teaching about destruction and all the turmoil that's going to come with the false Christ. Uh-uh, false. He comes in peacefully and prosperously saying, I am Jesus, and, and performs miracles in the sight of man, and many will believe him. We'll learn more as we get to chapter 13. Don't miss it. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The book of Ezekiel. What a fantastic study, this book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel that covers, if you would, those vehicles, those circular discs. In the Hebrew, it states very clearly that that whirlwind with the color amber traced back to the Hebrew, highly polished bronze. What an exciting thing that God's word informs us on all things. Ezekiel one of my favorite prophets of the Bible, probably more written, not probably, but absolutely more written on what will happen in the millennium age than even the book of Revelation. Ezekiel guiding you through it, what God will expect at the final battle, Armageddon and Haman Gog, recorded in this great prophecy. I know you're going to enjoy it, the book of Ezekiel. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We don't judge people. We don't want you to judge people. But you should discern. Discern truth and who you should study with who you should fellowship with, uh, do not be deceived in this generation. Very important. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure to hear from you. Now, you got a prayer request, you don't need the number, you don't need an address. God's the heart knower. He knows what's in your mind. You don't have to say it out loud. He hears you. So let him, what does he want mainly from you? Your love. You've got to let him know you love him in return. That's family. 
That's, that's your heavenly father. He's the one that created your very being. Um, and as, as we stated in the last lecture, Ezekiel 18, 4, he owns your soul. It's not yours. It's his. Because he wanted someone just like you. Let him know you love him. Won't you do that? Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with uh, Charles from North Carolina. Please explain the idea of rapture. Well, it's pretty hard to explain something that's not even biblical. The word rapture, I know this shocks a lot of people, the word rapture is not in the Bible. Okay. God has never said there would be a rapture. There is a gathering back to Christ, but it's going to happen like Paul said it would in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where he said, don't let some numbskull deceive you. We're not going to gather back to Christ until the false Christ is, sits in the temple of God showing the world that he is God. In other words, God's children have work to do, not to be flying off into outer space like some nitwit would have you believe. And I know that may offend some, but really, when that is taught as a truth and it has no foundation, and don't come back at me with 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, it would all show me you were ignorant and did not read 13 and 14, which sets the subject and explains what's going down there. The fact that if you believe Christ rose from the dead, you better believe everybody that's dead is with him already. They're not out here in a hole in the ground. And the air that is mentioned there is spiritual body, breath of air, breath of life, the spiritual body that we're at. The seventh trump, we're all changed into it. So. There you've got it. And if you want more information, I've got a work titled The uh, Question on the Rapture Doctrine. Help you a lot. Right from God's Word. Um, Alvester from Arkansas. I've been, I've been hearing your teaching for years, and I've learned a lot. But on 3.11.10, you said medication was uh, satanic. About s six or ten months ago, you said to continue on your prescribed medicine. Please explain. Well, you misunderstood what I said. In teaching uh, concerning who is left out of heaven, sorcerers. And I said the word sorcerer in the Greek is pharmaceutica, which our word pharmacist comes from it. And what I said was is drug users, illegal, and drug pushers and peddlers are not going to be in heaven. That has nothing to do with a legal, God-given right pharmacist that administers medication like Dr. Luke. Luke was a medical doctor, and God saw fit to use him um, to do much of Paul's uh, uh, scribeship for him. And, um, a, a fantastic uh, surgeon, physician. So there's nothing wrong. You should take your prescribed medicine. Uh, if, you know, if you have a good, I like Christian doctors, okay? But be that as it may. Uh, but you should always take your medication. All I was saying is that illegal drugs, let, let's get right down to where, where the rubber meets the road with it. A sorcerer, is somebody that puts people on a high, a spiritual high on drugs rather than the Holy Spirit. They're not going to make it. Why? Because it's trickery. Uh, Ruth from Virginia, my question, um, request please, explain the different spelling of Cain's descendants compared to the Canaanites. I'm sure I've not spelled this correct. Well, the um, Cain's descendants are spelled K-E-N-I-T-E. -E. K-E-N-I-T-E. -E. It's a Hebrew word that simply means the offspring of Cain. That's all it means in the Hebrew tongue, being fully translated rather than transliterated. So um, it has nothing to do with the Canaanites, and, 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 um, but um, spelled with the C. 
and uh, they are true Israelites, basically. Uh, Charles from Minnesota, do we have do we have guardian angels? Where is this mentioned in the Bible? Well, in, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 10, it does state, if you are one of God's saints, set aside ones, elect, that your angel has, not that he's going to help you, but he has the face of God at any time you need God's help. That's how closely God looks after his election. So what are you afraid of? Uh, and I'm, I'm, I mean in general, people should not fear. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself because our Father is still on the throne and he's going to stay there. No ifs, no ands, no maybes. Barbara from Kentucky. My question is when our flesh body dies and we are spiritually gone to be with the Lord, as it says, to be absent from the body is to present with the Lord, uh, when then the flesh body is put in the ground, why would it ever have to come up again when Christ returns? This is how people believe at my church. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, you see, the Bible itself makes it very clear what happens to the flesh when it goes into the ground. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. The spirit, which is the intellect of your soul and your spiritual body, instantly returns to the Father that gave it. Your flesh body goes back to dirt from which it came. It never is resurrected. As a matter of fact, Ecclesiastes chapter 9 is specially written to let you know what happens to flesh bodies, that um, they don't ever come back again. We don't need them. Why? We've got a much more perfect body. You know, the body that God created us in, that spiritual body where there is no pain and, um, and no aging, no disease, because when God does something, it's perfect. And you're, why would you ever, ever want a flesh body again when you have something so much better, the spiritual body? Everybody should make a real home study if you have confusion about that on 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Begin reading with verse 35 concerning planting a, even a grain of corn. It's got to die and go into the ground. It's gone. But in it is a little embryo and it springs to life and comes up out of that ground, a new plant, which that's what happens when this flesh dies. We've got a spiritual body that's far better and it continues on to say you have a terrestrial and a celestial body. You have an earthly body and you have a spirit body. The spirit body is what is eternal, okay? Uh, James from Texas. My question is, did God create all the prehistoric animals? I can't find it in the written word. If so, where did God create them and why? Well, they're, they're in the Word. Uh, you, you will find the dinosaur in the great book of Job, which is a very old book, in chapter 40 concerning the behemoth. And, and um, the main thing is, they're here. The artifacts are here. We have, we have uh, through archaeology, found most of the bones, the bodies, the structure, and a great deal of knowledge and information about them. And um, I'm, I'm not going to whip out my dinos mammoth tooth and all that business on you, but you know what I mean. Uh, you can believe, in fact, why, they're here, they're real. God doesn't have an imitation world, it's a real world. Even Christianity is not a religion, it's a reality. So. The Bible does speak of his animals, okay, and, um, and so it is. He even speaks of his, he loves animals, that's why he created them. And they're going to be with us even in the eternity as we learn in uh, Isaiah chapter 11. Uh, John from Michigan, I would like to know if the one world system will be set up before Satan comes to earth or is Satan going to set it up to deceive people. I, I think so. What do you think uh, or know? 
Well, I know about everything, I, I jest. Nobody knows everything. But I do know one thing. I know that um, the one world system, we are told, does not come into being because it receives, it almost does, and then it gets a deadly wound. You'll find this in the 13th chapter of Revelation, verse 4. That I know. Okay. But then the uh, dragon, which is Satan, another name for Satan, appears and performs a lot of pretty tricks and maneuvers and, and heals the wound, and the whole world whores after him, uh, believing him. He, then he fixes it. So, answer to the question, the one world system does not become de facto until after the false Christ appears. Almost, but not quite. Andretta from uh, Georgia. I cannot pass up this opportunity to, to ask you a question. <coughs> Excuse me. I pay my tithes on this. I, I, think, I, I put my... I can't quite make out your writing there. This from... Oh, this question, I think, is from my son. He asked me if God made the earth in six days and one day to God is a thousand years to us, was the earth made in 6,000 years? Add one more thousand, seven, okay? It took seven days. And seven days with the Lord is, th this is, if you stop and think, why when we see um, mammoths in Russia and Alaska under the t tundra, that a terrible thing happened about 14,000 years ago. Um, that's 7,000 in creation and 6,000 since, that's 13,000. So it all fits pretty good when you get right down to it, okay? And it's biblical. Um, Curtis from Arizona did, um, that may be Autus, but I'm going to say Curtis. David threw seven stones in a river before he fought Goliath. Could you tell me what those seven stones represent? Thank you. Uh, somebody's pulling your leg a little bit, or you've been taught wrong. David didn't pick up. He didn't throw seven stones in the, in the river. When he crossed the little draw, he picked up five stones. And he put him in the little, put him in the little bag for, 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 of slingshot stones. Five means grace, but you you need to read First uh, Samuel chapter seventeen, verse forty. First Samuel seventeen forty. Uh, the main thing David had with him was the grace from the five stones, because God was with him. And when the giant rumbled the ground and made all kinds of threats, David wasn't worried. He said, hey, God's with me, and we're going to take your head. And God did through David. Tony from Alabama. In Revelation, what does it mean when it says, hurt not the blood or the oil? If I may correct you, if I remember right, it's hurt not the oil or the wine. And I did stipulate in the sixth chapter when we went by there that the oil and the wine, the oil is symbolic of the oil of our people, Eliyah, in the Hebrew tongue, and the wine, of course, being symbolic of the blood of Christ, our communion. We don't want that messed with, regardless of seals or the presence on earth of, of an enemy. Carol from Dallas. In Genesis 4, I'm trying to so hard to understand everything about the Bible, but sometimes I get confused. Welcome to the club. In Genesis 4, when Eve says, referring to Cain's birth, I've gotten a man from the Lord, what did she mean? I thought Cain was Satan's seed. She said, if, if, Yahweh, meaning with the help of God. She did, they were innocent. They didn't know. But you see, what most people don't understand is in verse 2 of chapter 4, it stipulates in verse 1 that Adam knew her and she conceived, but she had already conceived back in chapter 3, verse 15. And it says in verse 
2 of chapter 4 that instead of the word again, that again she bare a child, it says she continued bearing children, meaning they were twins. By separate fathers, yes. Why, well, how can you be sure they were separate fathers? Well, uh, look at the genealogies. You will not find Cain in Adam's genealogy. And that's pretty obvious, is it not? Well, did God make a mistake like that? God did not make a mistake. Never does. Uh, man makes mistakes at times. Father doesn't. Helen from Ohio. Where does it talk about a woman should cover her head? Scripture reference, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10. But what should a woman cover her head with? Because what does verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 11 say? It says a woman should cover her head because of the angels, meaning the fallen angels in the end times that are going to be cast out of heaven with Satan. You're supposed to have Christ over your head where they can't bother you. Why? Because Christ gives you power over all your enemies. In Christ's name, you have power over them. Boom. They got to go. They don't have room for a woman of God that has Christ over her head. And well, why would it be a shame for a man to have that same covering there? And them? Well, because uh, it shouldn't be needed, should it? How, how could a man possibly be drawn to another man um, and um, without it being perverted, of course? Cindy from North Carolina. That, that's God's teachings. Like it or lump it. Question, I've ordered the Apocrypha. What is your favorite book or passage? Cindy from North Carolina. Well, I hope you ordered our, uh, it from us so that it is a good speed. And if, if it is a good speed, otherwise you wouldn't have it, my favorite. But in the book of Ezra, in chapter 7, verse 77, in the good speed, you have a continuation of what it's like in heaven. That's kind of what's really going on there. Kind of some of my favorite scripture. And um, do I teach it biblically? No, but I like to read it. Uh, Beth from Illinois. Uh, let, let, let me, let me, lest I deceive, lest, lest I mislead someone. Much of the Apocrypha is backed up in, in the um, Masara, uh, such as the books of Esdras. Esdras is simply the Hebrew word Ezra, and it is a continuation of that, and you can back them up in the Masara. But some of it is questionable, but be that as it may, it's not going to hurt you if you're a real Christian. Beth from Illinois, her question, her question, I better, my friend Joan and I were talking and she asked a really good question about, that I wasn't so sure how to answer. We both know that when small children or, and babies that pass away will go to heaven, her question is, will they remain as small children, babies, or will they be adults? We're all the same age in spiritual bodies, adults. And we appear to be about like Christ was when he left, about 30, uh, full adult. But there's no such thing as age in a spiritual body. Uh, uh, Kathina from um, California. Question, how long after the crucifixion of Jesus was Paul called to be an apostle? Thank you for your teaching of the word. You really bring it to life. Well, thank you. Uh, Paul, Paul was um, called in the year 35 A.D. That's Anno Domini, with the year of our Lord, being in the in the Latin, Domine. Uh, so, so if Christ was crucified along about 33, it would 35. Paul's conversion about two years later. Uh, Pastor Marie William from South Carolina. I was recently listening to one of your lectures and you said that Adumia is Russia. Please explain the connection. Maps of ancient Israel show Adumia, Edom, being on the southwest shores of the Dead Sea, not where modern day Russia is. I do not doubt you as you are the smartest man I've ever encountered. I am just wondering the connection. Well, 
Thank you for your comment, for your compliment. Uh, understand God said he was going to scatter Israel and all the people there. He did. And uh, the prophecy concerning Esau, when you go to Genesis chapter 25 through chapter 27, chapter 27, the curse that was placed upon Esau was that he would live in the Hebrew not on the fat of the land, but away from the fat of the land. And meaning uh, so far north that their growing seasons are not going to be good like ours down south, okay, in the southern. So Russia today, as it would settle as the migrations took place, and it's, it's through history, it's not that difficult to trace Esau and Edom, okay. Edom means red in the Hebrew tongue. It's a red nation, okay? It's uh, pre pretty easily documented. Uh, okay, I'm out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all a great deal because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Most of all, though, God loves you for it. It's His letter to you. It makes His day. And when you make God's day, boy, is He going to make yours. Just let Him know you love Him at the same time. Your family. And he, love, he returns that love and um, is um, so happy that you are reading the letter of instruction telling you how to find happiness. Now, we're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He'll always bless you, okay? Most important, though, you listen to me. You stay in his word every day. And his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.
here is Pastor Murray. From Gravit, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book-by-book, chapter-by-chapter, line-by-line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Our praise God, we've been waiting on you, and we're ready to get into the word. We're going to leave the Psalms for a day or two. I want to get into a little different subject as I told you I was going to be speaking over the